everybody, how's it going? So we've got an extreme special guest here on the show. This is kind of like one of those holy crap moments for me. We've got Mr. Paul Lonnie on the show. And Paul has an illustrious career as a producer and mix engineer here in Los Angeles. And most notably, Paul mixed one of my absolute favorite records ever. It's in my top five metal records you have to listen to before you die. And that's Megadeth's piece, Cells. Now, this all came about because I'm doing a piece on the Loudness Wars, and I wanted to take a listen to the original Megadeth mixes and masters and put them up against the modern remasters. And it was really, you know, kind of a Star Wars moment where George Lucas redid a few key scenes and let Greedo short shoot first. It's kind of like, that's what I thought about the new Megadeth masters. I'm like, what the fuck are you guys thinking? So <laughs> one thing leads to another, and uh, we've got Paul on the show, the original mix engineer. Um, so welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day for 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 coming on board. Oh, wow. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. Fantastic. Um, okay, so yeah, right from the get-go. So you were brought in as a mix engineer from what I was reading, and Wikipedia can get it wrong sometimes. Um, Peace Cells was originally recorded for Combat Records, and Megadeth somehow managed to get signed to Capital in the process, and that's Capital brought you in to remix this, correct? Yes, exactly. Okay. And what was the experience like? Did you have the band like in the room with you? Were you doing most of this stuff by yourself? Um, you know, where, 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 where were you taking your inspiration to mix this from? Um, you know what? Um, it really goes along the lines how things are now for the most part is I would work from like 10 o'clock in the morning until about 4, 3, 30, 4 in the afternoon, okay. 5 o'clock. Then uh, the band would show up. Usually it would be Dave Ellison and also Dave Mustaine. Okay. Um, they were mainly the two guys who would come and check out the mixes. Also, Capital Casey would come down, uh, an a and uh, guy named Tom Wally, who actually brought me onto the project. Okay. And... Um, we would listen to the mixes. I remember back then, it was actually, I mean, this was a while back, but I would record a, a cassette tape and we'd go into the lounge and I had these two little battery powered Akai speakers with little volume um, controls on it and my little portable cassette player. And I was basically checking the mixes on these speakers that were probably about four inches tall. They were, they were, okay, cool. They were very small. And I go, yeah, okay, cool. Why don't we try that? And and I just hear, you know, I want a little more of this or a little less. And I go and tweak a little bit. And it was pretty much, if I remember, it was a song a day. It was a song a day. Okay, cool. And so it would have been about eight days then because that was a real short record. It was 43 minutes of probably one of the most densest batch of tracks ever. And um, I just absolutely love the music on that. Well, maybe it was, it was short. Maybe it was short time wise, but there was actually a lot of, which is what makes the album so cool musically. There's a lot of cool progressive music sections and key changes and scene mm -hmm. changes and pocket changes, which made the mixing, um, you know, uh, challenging, I guess. Is, is oh, yeah. Word. Especially back in those days, because you didn't have undo, you know, you didn't have instant recall, all that kind of crap. What kind of board were you working with back then? But like, that's also know. liberating to not have undo. That's the curse oh, of yeah. modern music is the Apple Z, right? Oh, um, God. Yeah. You're, 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 you're not kidding, man. It's like the problem with having a million options is we have a million options. Back then, you know, you kind of had to make a decision and stick with it. Yeah. But, um, you had asked about what kind of uh, board that was mixed on. That was mixed on an SSL E series. Okay. It was a. I think we got one of those right here. <laughs> you sure do. And uh, it's a. It was either a forty-eight input or maybe a fifty-six, but I think it was a forty-eight. Okay. All input. right. Minimal outboard gear. I mainly use the console for everything. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. All right. I've got a very interesting episode coming up on what makes the SSL compressor so great. And it's going to be shocking because Warren's got a few extra SSL boards kicking around here. So I'm going to be able to oh. show you guys what's what's under the hood there. And oh, the, cool. the, the, uh, the story behind that is going to be quite shocking to a lot of you guys. I guarantee that. But uh, yeah, no, that's yeah, cool yeah. because... Because sonically, I love just how dense that record sounds. Like the guitar sounds huge, but the drum sound for me, especially when it comes to how drums should sound on a metal record, that's one of my go-to albums. The drum sound was just so monstrous on that. With, with, with the drums on that, I believe, if I remember correctly, I was 
adding, I was augmenting just a hint of some drum samples. But I remember I also was... <laughs> was what's that? Okay. Oh, I, I think I just got owned. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mr. Anti Drum Samples, and it's it's hilarious. Okay, so one of my favorite records had samples on it. Wonderful. Yeah, pr- probably if I recall correctly. But I, like I said, it was just a hint. Like I don't really replace drums. Sure. Even now, it's just the ring of a snare drum or the front hand of a bass drum to, you know, to to, mm-hmm. to fire off room reverbs or anything. All that. I don't really use that much, depending on mm-hmm. what shape the drums are in. Okay. Because um. What I was doing is I had a Juno 106 keyboard that I would basically use to, I was oscillating a low end rumble. So it sounded like a massive earthquake, like a solid, like surge of everything from 40 cycles to 200 cycles that would just go in the bottom end. And I would, and I, and I would trigger the bass drum to get that Mm -hmm. to open up every time a bass drum would hit. And I think I did it also. I I oscillated some white noise and had that fire off the snare drum to get a crunch, you know, so that the bass drum would have some subsonic weight to it and push air because I wanted music like that, although it is speed metal, basically, um, and, and the tempos are extremely fast. I still wanted it to have controlled weight and force and command. To okay. it. So I would use that keyboard actually as part of the drum sound. Okay. Wow. Learning something new every day. See, now this is the thing. I always go back to this. This is how <laughs> drums sit. What are you doing using samples? It's like, okay. Oh, I just got crushed, <laughs> but <laughs> it's all good. Now. Wow. No, no, no. This is great. This is a real eye opener. I have experimented around with both those things using like, you know, like a low frequency sine wave to augment the kick drum and a little yep. bit of white noise on the snare. And that can yeah. go a long way. You just need a tiny bit. Just a tiny my, bit, and it adds flavor and color, you know? Yeah. My question is, uh, what about the toms on that record? Because the toms were just just monstrous. They're just rolling thunder as far as I'm concerned. Did you have any augmentation going on those? No, I probably just used the SSL. I mean, I'm okay. probably not too conservative with equalization. Okay. Um, and, I mean, the toms, I'm always trying to get a full body tom. I, mean, I haven't heard the album in, in quite a few years now. I don't know, but I'm going to usually get um, as much as I can to get a bottom head, you know, the weight and the tone and, and just the mass of a bottom head, but the attack. So it's probably a lot of equalization, scooping out the weird stuff, using not always slow attack compression, but fast attack compression because a faster attack compression on the toms that's still going to feed an overall drum bus compressor or the stereo bus compressor right so that's going to give it the attack and the assault and the upfront thing plus i usually if i wasn't back then if i wasn't riding the toms way up for those hits i was probably gating or using the cut buttons to just open those up because this is before pro tools oh yeah any of that stuff i mean pro tools probably came out like two or three years after that Sound, yep. sound toys or whatever it's called. Not, not sound, sound tools. Toys. I remember that. We sound had that in tools, college. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then it morphed eventually into Pro Tools. Yeah. But I remember that. We were all like, whoa, what's this going to be? And it's like, yeah, it's yeah. a blessing and a curse. <laughs> yeah. So it was wild. You know, you still had analog tape and mm-hmm. and doing all that, which also is your friend, too, because you get a beautiful saturation on tape. Right. Which we all try and replicate in our DAWs now, you know, so. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Okay, no, that's cool. Like, uh, that's great. I finally got to pick the guy who makes making this brains about <laughs> about about that Tom sound. Yeah, because I, I just listened to that back because I used to listen. I remember being a kid in college when I, I was taking media arts, and I'd sit there and put on piece cells with headphones and just analyze the mixes, what was going on, that kind wow. of thing. And it was just you know, like I said, this is kind of one of my go tos about how a good metal record should sound and. You know, I just remember the tom sound just being so absolutely massive. And I'm like, okay, these this is the kind of tom sound I want on my records kind of thing. So, Oh, wow, cool. So so thanks for being such a massive inspiration on that. That's really cool. Obviously, of course, a lot of credit goes to Garcia Mielsen, the drummer, who was just a phenomenal drummer. Monster. Well, well, well the thing about him was that he was more from the jazz school of drums. Right. And, and he was really, he had a great pocket. He had a great feel. His parts were wonderful. 
Yeah, they really were. And uh, Chris Pohl and the guitar player, the lead player at the time, too, was also a jazz guy, as I recall. So, yeah, the yeah. leads were kind of all over the place. Yeah. These are really solid players. And, yeah. Dave, and Dave was amazing on bass. And Dave yep. Mustaine, I mean, you know, what do, what, what yeah. do you say? I mean, super, super talent. And, uh, and the music, the writing was just off the chain. It really was. I think they're on a creative peak right there. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't think they've written anything better than what was on that album. I mean, my personal favorite on there was Good Morning Black Friday. I mean, like, just as an overall suite of music. I mean, like, it just went through so many mood changes and whatnot. Yeah, it really had a progressive symphonic almost thing. And the scene changes and the, it, it was beautiful music. I mean, it really was. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, I was really fortunate to be a part of that album. Yeah, that, that was absolutely amazing. So I'm sure everybody's asking, what was up with the guitar sounds? Yeah, what was up with the guitar sounds on that record? Do you, do you have any idea what was going on, like, signal-wise, what they were using and, and when they were tracking it? Or did you get any of that information? No, I don't. I mean, the only thing that I could offer would be the album after that, which I produced, uh, So Far So Good, So What? Another as, awesome record. <laughs> yeah, and it, oh, cool. And it, as far as the... Um, as far as the gear that we were using, they were mainly playing Jackson guitars. Mm -hmm. um, the guitar amps, gee, I don't know. I mean, there must have been Marshalls around, but I don't know if there was any special amps or anything. But um, as far as the tones, I mean, on the Peace Cells record, again, it was mainly board EQ. All okay. that was board EQ and just uh, maybe a hint of some outboard stuff on it, just to carve okay. it out. Cool. All right. So all you guys out there with the Brandworks plugins or the Waves plugins and whatnot, go break out your SSL emulations and you can get some <laughs> cool 80s thrash going on. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so far, so, so good. So what they brought you in to produce that um, yes. after Peace Cells. And that was, that was another, you know, absolute classic. You know, there's some abs absolutely just amazing songs on there. Obviously, In My Darkest Hour. And um, one of my personal favorites, uh, Set the World on Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here's a good one. What did you guys use for that explosion sound in the beginning? Because that was freaking huge. I think I got that off of a sound library. I thought it would be a great way to start the album with that bomb drop. Yeah. And just starting in that, on that, right? Isn't yeah. that how the album starts? It was great. We, we used to like air drum that when we were kids, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. I was, I was just always uh, looking for flavor and color and to make sure, you know, we worked hard on the arrangements on that album. And they were just kind of looking for an edge at radio. It's kind of like, even on the Peace Cells, I was always looking for little flavor moments to make things just be a little more accessible. Like even on the song Peace Cells, who's buying mm -hmm. in the chorus, uh, da, 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 there's a new yeah. way. Um, yeah. The guitars to that, there's a new way. It was the guitars were going straight through that. But mm -hmm. I kind of thought it would it kind of I just had this thought to try it a breakdown there and make it more of a call and answer thing. So da 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 cut yeah. the guitars. If there's a right. new way and hear hear the drum sound going and and do that, which Mustaine felt it gave it a little bit more of a radio, you know, help, you know. Right. So you're always looking for stuff like that when you're mixing. Just using a cut button here and there occasionally can really add some nice little flavor. Now, that's something interesting. Um, I, I, find, I find that really interesting because I've tried to do that on certain records, and I find a lot of musicians are just like, nope, leave it the way it was. You know, they just really don't want to budge on anything. No, I, um, I, I understand that. It's just that for me, I figure if I feel it, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to show it to mm -hmm. them. And they yeah. have a thousand percent veto power. It's their music. It's their canvas. And okay. you know what? I'm even curious myself. I won't know until I hear it and live with it for five or ten minutes and just see if it still feels good or if it feels contrived or fake or forced. Mm -hmm. Then I won't go for it. But um, I just try things and show the artist what I might hear. And a lot of times they go, hey, cool. We like that. But if not. It goes right back. I mean, okay. No, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really hard to work with people who are precious. I'm mean, like you say, you have those challenges. It's kind of tough if you're brought in as a producer to go over arrangement ideas and things, and they just shoot the, and they keep shooting things down. It's like that's hard, man. What do yeah. you do? Well, in my in my situation, yeah, I've had that happen a lot. Hey, why don't you try this? Nope. Why don't we try this? Nope. Sometimes I'll, I, you know, if I got a really cool idea, I'll just be like, hey, um. 
let's try this. Well, no, we don't want to do it. I'm like, let's try it. And if you don't like it, we'll go back to your way. You know? And then they're usually like, yep. okay, let's check it out anyway. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, I, I like I liked that. I didn't know that was a muting idea because that's that's such a great hook there for that song. You yeah, know, with that sort of song. Yeah, it just it just grabs you. I was like, I remember yeah. again. I remember being a sixteen year old kid listening to that and going, "Holy shit, what is this? This is great. This is awesome." Well, well it showcased the vocal. It gave it a call mm. and answer thing, and it let the mm. drum sound come through for like almost a dance record, you know, which I wanted to get that pulse without it being a dance record. Sure. So. Okay. That, that's a, that's unreal. <laughs> awesome. So okay. Uh, well, I still got you here. So far, so good. So what? Yeah. So <laughs> how long w was that process? And that went on to be mixed by Michael Wagner, who's also absolutely fucking amazing. I still got to get him on the show at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the reason why they brought him on is because they were going, they were talking, they were really impressed with an album, uh, the Tooth and Nail album. Docking, yeah. yep. Yeah, and so Michael was involved in that, and they wanted to bring in that flavor, so they brought me in, but... Um, because I mixed that album also myself, and, and I was going for more of what I thought Megadeth to be, but they were wanting to visit that. And like I said, hey, mm -hmm. they can do what they want. So, oh, absolutely, yeah. The but Art that album yeah, ultimately... was a very challenging album. That, that was like four and a half months. We spent a fortune on that album. Wow. Yeah, four and a half months. Back in the day, right? When Holy shit. When books were a budget, a real budget. Wow. And um, it was mainly just trying to get the best performances you know i tend to i've been told that when i'm producing i usually tend to take people out of their comfort zone pushing them to do things that they didn't feel they could do or wanted to do or knew they could do you know more than anything and uh that's a lot of what that album was about um getting vocal performances out of dave mustaine and just doing whatever it takes yeah, I, I always said, you know, musicians sound the best when they push them to their breaking point. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Again, I always go back to the old Bruce Dickinson um, uh, Number of the Beast story when they were doing the I lived alone, my mind was blank thing. And they did it, you know, for like six or seven hours straight. And then oh, they wow. let them do the scream. <laughs> and that's how you get that awesome scream. <laughs> that's just awesome. seven hours of frustration. I guess he was throwing chairs across the room and shit. Why can't I do the scream? You know, so I, I could definitely see that, of course. I, 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 I can imagine that would be a little bit intimidating doing that with with a guy like Dave Mustaine. No, Dave, let's do it again. You know, how do you say no to a guy like that? No, that wasn't good enough. Yeah, he was actually, he was really open and really cool to work with. I mean, that album definitely had its okay. challenges. But um, sure. even for the vocals, because I'm always looking for a sense of truth and honesty and urgency. And the lyrics on this stuff, I mean, he writes great lyrics. And it's really, a lot of the stuff is intense. And I'd be mm -hmm. out with him right at the vocal mic and... I just say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Yeah, you're singing in tune and in time, but I don't believe what you're saying. And I just punch him while he's singing just to get performances out of him. Wow. At the end of it, he'd be saying, nobody cared about me like this to get these performances. And he'd be like, you know, high fiving and all this stuff and so excited because I was just well, trying to fire him up to get emotion out of him. Well, mission so, accomplished. You listen to the vocal on In My Darkest Hour. That's probably one of Mustaine's finest moments. I'm not trying to snag any credit on that. I mean, he's amazing. But um, I'm just saying as a producer, you kind of I always felt like I need to do whatever it takes to get the most engaging, fulfilling music experience. I mean, I don't like to listen to a record. I like to step inside a record and experience it. The same as mixing. It's got to be just an emotional experience. You got to okay. bring it, man. You got to bring it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I always measure an album by, you know, does it make my hair stand on end? You know, that's <laughs> exactly. what got me into metal to begin with. It's, 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 hair on my arm, if the hair on my arms is standing up, yes, yeah, so it makes it a connection. That's uh, definitely the way I'll do it. And yeah, those were cool. some some real spine tinglers. Anyway, uh, I'm sure we could go on for hours and hours and hours. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. It's such an honor to have you and actually sit here and talk oh, about please, this. Oh, please, it's just me. It, it's really <laughs> nice to, you know, hang out. Well, well, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, when this whole COVID thing ends, I would love to, you to actually come on the show or I come to your place and you can show us what you're up to, that kind of thing, if that's possible. Love to have you back on at some point and maybe just kind of go over your routine and show us what you're doing these days. Yeah, I mean, it's what everybody's doing. We're all 
in Pro Tools and mixing away and doing our thing, right? Fantastic. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, there we go. That's Mr. Paul Lani, uh, producer and engineer for Megadeth in the 80s, making two really incredible records, Peace Cells, and So Far So Good, So What. You should definitely check those records out if you haven't, because there's some absolutely incredible guitar playing and amazing songwriting on those records, not to mention some pretty amazing drum sounds, even if they do have a bit of a Juno on there. <laughs> 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 anyway, Paul, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Like I said, it's it's a, it's a real honor. Take care. Oh, man. Thank you so Take much, Glenn. Care.